Lee. Yes. All can right. you, <laughs> can you hear me? There's my guy. How are you doing, Will? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm just going to get started with a little intro and then we're going to jump right into it. I can't wait to learn. I have my, my notebook here <laughs> and I'm getting ready to take notes. I hope a lot of our listeners are getting ready to learn from the best. So let me just introduce Lee. Um, this is a relatively easy intro for me because I know Lee personally. I've actually been to his house. Um, We've hung on the, out. The, on the, yeah, that's right. On the retreat, which was one of the highlights of that year. What year was that, Lee? Do you remember? Well, it would have been two years ago now, right? I think. Right, it was, it, yeah. Yeah, it would have been, uh, yeah, 18, I think. And I just learned a ton. Um, Lee has been doing this for over 30 years. He has helped players of all levels, which is one of the things that I respect most about Lee is that he doesn't just put himself into one level. He can literally work with kids all the way up to the professional level. I've seen him work with NBA caliber levels all the way down to um, the youth level. Um, and in my 10 years, and I'll say this slightly, in my 10 years of being in the industry, I've been to about four continents to learn about speed. And I keep coming back to ask Lee for advice on a number of different things. Um, but the thing that makes him most special is his holistic approach to combining knowledge of different fields. And that's what makes him the best. So Lee, thank you so much for coming on the, the podcast today. Oh, what an honor. I was so excited when you asked me, Will. And uh, it's funny because my son, Brennan, he, he, remembers, he remembers the history lesson that, that he got <laughs> <laughs> when, when uh, you were here and we hung out for a while. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I see he's getting strong. He's, he's getting strong now, huh? He is. He's enjoying it, and he's got his own little program, and he likes to learn, and he likes to experiment, and he'll ask me, say, well, how about this? And so we'll add different stuff, and yeah, it's, yes. been, it's been great, yeah. And he's 12, his, so. His clean form is looking pretty good. I, yes. I saw yeah. that. It's, yeah. it's coming along. Well, Lee, why don't you just give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background about yourself. Um, where are you from? How did you grow up? And really, how did you fall in love with basketball? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm from northern New York. I'm from above Albany in that area. And, yeah. uh, you know, I grew up in a family of uh, six. I'm the youngest of six, uh, three boys, three girls. Uh, my dad uh, was an athletic director. He was my principal at the end, but he was also athletic director. But prior, he was a phys ed and coach for years and years. So that's mm. what I grew up around. And then my brothers were coaches and phys ed teachers and administrators. And my sisters were involved in athletics and, and uh, teaching as well. Um, so I went into phys ed. That, that's how I started. So for two years when I graduated college, I ended up going into teaching. And then I, I knew I wanted to do more in the field of strength and conditioning and just pure mm. coaching. So I kind of moved on. And, and I ended up at uh, uh, what's called Boletary's Tennis Academy. Most people might know it as IMG now. Right. Yeah, so when I was there in 91, it was just a tennis academy. And from that point on, I just have kind of explored the strength and conditioning and owned several facilities. And, uh, right. you know, and even though I've worked with tons of different athletes, you know, basketball has always been something I've been really passionate about because I played it through college, mm. worked with a lot of athletes. Actually, later today, I'm doing a live Instagram with Jimmer Fredette and putting him through a live workout. And, nice you know and yeah of course jimmer played over in china and has played he's in greece now and played in the nba so um you know so my whole family has been involved with it you know and it's right. uh, just something that i've always you know doesn't matter the sport that i train i love them all but there's something about that uh you know being in that gym and hearing that bounce you know that's that's the best feeling and are you currently still a bas um do you still work with basketball players in terms i mean the technical part or is that just what you did when uh, Jay, Jay, Jay and Bailey, who are your daughters, were around? Yeah, I, I do it primarily with them, but I still get calls all the time. It wasn't, it was just a few weeks ago, I was actually breaking down a video of a guy and his son who's his. So it might just have a little bit of technical issues. I'm sure he'll be back. Yep. Sorry, with it. Yep. Yep. Got me good. All good. All good. Yeah. So you're talking about uh, uh, film. Yeah. So I was breaking down some film of a of a dad of a son who's like going to be a freshman in high school. So I still do a lot of mechanical breakdown of the technique and ball handling things like that. 
uh, but but I can also train them athletically to be able to move better. So, but yeah, I enjoy it. I, I'll tell you what, Will, if I could get a job that would support me, I'd go into coaching in a, in a second. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that talking about youth development, I want to, you're one of the most respected, or I respect you as one of the experts when it comes to long-term athletic development, just because you work with so many different levels and especially youth. So when you look at a youth player, how early should it be when we actually get into the technical parts of moving, not just as a basketball player, but as an athlete? Right. So I think early on, when we have a kid that is, or an athlete that's, you know, in the seven, eight, nine year old, 10 year old range, what we want to do is we want to really use a lot of, a lot of guided discovery on basic fundamentals of movement, like making sure their arm action is somewhat fluid making sure they understand staying level when they move laterally and not jumping up and down. I don't want to go into too much technical joint position, right. um, loading systems, because what's going to happen is when they hit a growth spurt, what they learned when they were like four foot eight inches tall is going mm -hmm. to change. And all of a sudden they go through puberty and now they're five foot eight inches tall and they're stronger and they're lankier. All those things that I taught them before won't apply anymore. So I don't want to go that technical anyway. I want them to self-absorb the movement and feel very comfortable in their own skin at that age. And then as they get older and they're more solidified as a, as a person, like they're, they've gone through puberty and they're stronger, then I can start to dial in on specific techniques. Okay. Do you think of when you're training, say, the ages of, let's just say 10, 10, 10 to 13, how much of it has to be, I don't want to say entertainment, but how much of it has to be fun where they're more thinking of maybe obstacles and e invasion, evasion, that kind of stuff. How, how much of it has to be uh, game-like, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think when you start hitting that age right there, you want to have at least 50% of it. So okay. if, if I'm, because what I can do, Will, is I can say, let's say you and I and two other people, we're doing we're, we're warmed up and now we're gonna play some kind of tag game or some kind of obstacle. Well, we can go through that game and then we can take just a few minutes and well, let's break down the technique. This is why you kept getting caught in tag. This is why you kept stumbling during the obstacle course. Think about doing this with your feet. Think about your arm action. Think about you know making sure your base is wide enough. So I can, I can actually utilize the play-like atmosphere to assess for myself, but also to tell the athlete when they stumbled and to say, do you see why you keep stumbling? Mm. This is what we have to do. And they can say, yeah, every time I plant with my left foot, I seem to lose my balance. I'm like, exactly. This is why we want you to now stay lower and get a little bit wider with that foot. And, and it's, very, um, it's very fresh in their memory because they just struggled with it. So that's a great time to use play and instruction and yep. put them up against each other. Right. And keep going on the path of youth. When you think of long-term athletic development, how much do you think about, say, sensitive periods? And uh, everybody's a little bit different when, in terms of growing up and, maturing, uh, and maturity. But it's often talked about there are periods of, a young athlete's life where they are sensitive to certain things. Yeah. For example, coordination, um, hand -eye, like hand-eye coordination or speed. How, um, when you're developing a program, how much of that do you think about? Yeah, I think early on, and it's funny, I'm creating some stuff now to help people understand that better. I'm working on some systems for them to understand when they have like a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, mm. six-year-old, things that they can be doing that are fun but they're gonna help the athlete understand, like you had mentioned, coordination, hand-eye coordination, tracking, reading speeds, reading angles. So when an athlete is not, or a child is not in a major um, developmental change, so they're mm. not growing, uh, they're kind of steady, like there's that growth velocity, um, you know, uh, stage that they're gonna go through when you gotta be careful of hard pounding or, technical things because they're just they're changing too much so when they're younger and they're they're pretty well established as to how their body's moving and they're not in pain they don't have like growing pains and stuff like that we can really gain a lot of value in like some speed training maybe learning how to jump and generate power 
how to throw a medicine ball really hard, things like that. And then when they go into the growth, now we can start to work on mobility, coordination, balance, um, some maybe just simple concentric type mo mo motion and back off a little bit of the hard uh, eccentric loading because their joints are a little bit sore and maybe a little bit stiff. So yeah, we definitely want to make sure we're paying attention to those sensitive periods. But here's the beauty of this. This is the part that I think um, if you listen to a lot of the guys, you know, he's passed away now, but Dr. Or, um, Joseph Drabeck, who did a great job of creating stuff, and there's been many others, is a skill is not foreign to any age population. So once you reach the age of around three, your ability to perform almost any kind of movement is already there. How mm. well you perform it comes with time and experience. So I would like an athlete to learn the basic seven movement patterns, which are jump, back pedal, hip turn, uh, lateral run, lateral shuffle, linear acceleration, and sprint. I would like them to m work on those all the time. How the intensity is and the volume, that's where I'm going to adjust. Because your eight-year-old that you're working with right now can do the same thing that your professional player can do. They just can't do it at the same intensity, but they have that ability. Now, that's different in the weight room, right, and some of the stuff. But when it comes to athletic movement, because that's a self-preservation tactic that I have. Young kids can run away from somebody just like an older adult can. So that's why the sensitive periods are important. But the ability to do those all the time are actually already ingrained. Right. Which actually leads me to two questions would be, how then would you try and coach them when it comes to perfecting, well, not perfecting or right. enhancing their movement skills, but not coaching that out of them, if that makes sense? Yeah. Because we want them to move as naturally as possible. How do we try and help them, but at the same time, not coach that innate ability out of them? Yeah, yeah, right. So as much as possible, make it task oriented. Okay, so if you're standing in front of me and you're about 12 feet from me and you have a basketball and you hold that basketball out to your side at about your shoulder height and you just say, hey, Lee, when I drop this ball, run, get it before it bounces twice and then perform a jump stop. Okay, I am not thinking about my footwork. I'm not thinking about anything but the task of catching that ball. That does two things. It makes me work really hard because I, you've given me a – a rule. You said, don't let it bounce twice. So that means I got to hustle. But from your standpoint, it gives you a really good assessment of my strategy to get there. Because I might take off running with two arms out in front of me, like I'm trying to catch a baby who just fell out of a burning building, right? Well, you're going to say, well, okay, you caught the ball, but you didn't accelerate really well because you didn't use your arms. Okay. So now all I have to do is now, the next time we do it, just think about maybe two arm actions and then reach and catch because that's going to help me accelerate more. So that's an example of the task drives the skill you're after. And then you can use that as an assessment tool to say, see, if you use your arms, you're going to have a little bit more power. But I'm still task driven. I'm trying to accomplish the task, which connects the central nervous system better to the movements. And that's really what we want. Not at a young age, but say when they're teenagers. I'm just thinking about this. Yeah. How often would you use film to give them feedback? I, I like to use it when I feel it's going to overcome an obstacle. Okay, so when I assess an athlete's movement, I use what's called summary feedback. Okay, so let's say, Will, you're my athlete, and we just did a lateral shuffle. And I'm going to say, hey, Will, how did you feel? How did that feel? Did that feel pretty good? And if you say to me, I felt like I was slow. I can take the film now and say, well, look at, you see how close your feet, you never actually pushed very hard. Your feet were always kind of close together. You never actually exploded and pushed. And you can look at it and say, okay, yes, that makes sense to me now. But if I use it all the time, what happens is they become reliant on the film versus the feel. Okay, they want to feel. I just want to use that film to say, this is why you're feeling what you're feeling. Can you see this? Even like t teaching them to shoot. If I say your elbows on, they're like, I don't feel like my elbows on. Well, I'm like, look at, this is where you are. This is why you're having a hard time keeping the ball straight. Mm. Like, it doesn't feel like that. So then we can make adjustments. 
You know, one of the good things about talking to you is you have such a wide range of knowledge. Um, I want to go back into the strength and conditioning part. So when you think of strength training, okay, especially for kids, younger kids, and I'm talking about like eight to 12, yeah. strength at that point might not be in their sensitive period. But does that mean that we don't work on strength with that age group? Because if you think about strength training, right, it has a different definition to anyone. Now, if you're talking about a professional athlete or someone in the NFL, or any, any higher level athlete, well, a body weight squat to them is probably going to be a warm up. But yeah. then for a kid that age, uh, much younger, it could be in fact strength training. Can you talk a little bit about how you take strength training and apply it to younger athletes? Yeah, definitely. I'm a huge fan of it. My yeah. own kids, my oldest right. daughter being 22, then a 20 year old daughter, then my 12 year old son, yeah. they've all done it. Um, they did it when they were really young. And what I was after is number one, I can set their ceiling higher when they get older. Because when they're young, they start to understand balance points. They understand when they squat using the whole foot. They mm. understand positioning. Their intrinsic muscles start to adapt to the stress of stabilizing an object, which could be holding a four pound medicine ball. It could be them taking a PVC pipe over their head and squatting with that. Now that shifts their center of mass differently. So what's important to me in strength training is I'm trying to make a central nervous system change. So like coordination, inter and intermuscular coordination, they learn at a young age really, really well. They, they learn summation of movement. So if you want to teach them like how to do maybe a power shrug or what we would call a hang pull or something like that, well, if you teach them young, they'll pick it up like this because they don't have a lot of disturbances. Like mm -hmm. they haven't taught it wrong. So they get it really well. Now when I want to teach them to jump or to perform another, maybe a broad jump, that sequence that I gave them of strength training can be transferable to them. Right. So at the young age, it sets patterning for them. It teaches them summation of movement. They develop tremendous coordination of those patterns. And then number one, they've, they've been set up to be able to do it really well when they're older because they already learned all the patterns. Even if you took a PVC pipe and taught them how to bench press, all right? Mm. Now they know how to do the pattern and they know how to move their scapula and move their shoulder. Now when they're older and you want to load them, they're already, they've been there, done that. So it's much easier to teach them. When I first met you live, I believe it was in Japan, right? It was in, it was yes. in Japan, right? Was. I, I was thoroughly impressed with all the information that was given and you just broke it down into the seven different movements. And I'm just thinking, especially when it applies to basketball, one is how does basketball movement differ from a lot of the other sports that you may see? Like for instance, you might not see a lot of absolute speed in basketball because you just don't have the chance to get to that speed. Doesn't mean we don't work on absolute speed mechanics, just that we may not see it in the game. But when you broke down multi-directional speed, which is obviously extremely important to basketball, how do you get that to transfer onto the court? That's a great question because there's really like three things that you're gonna look at always. A basketball player, compared to a soccer athlete, right? What does a soccer athlete have to do? They got to get their feet in position to make a play. A yep. basketball player has to get their hands, their body, their physical body in position to maybe make a play defensively or offensively in, in, in terms of like a box out or whatever. And then they have to get their eyes in position. You got nine other players out there moving around. You have to have vision tunnels, right? And vision lines. So a lot of times I'm moving my body quickly and explosively so I can see better, all right? So now the thing that a basketball player has to be able to do is they have to be able to play at a level, meaning height, okay? That allows them to be explosive, under control, the ability to change directions and still be able to make a play with their hands if the ball's in their hands or maybe they're trying to you know, rebound or defend that ball, right? So when they accelerate, so let's say we're teaching acceleration to, to a basketball athlete. Initially, I want them to learn the system of accelerating, how to push, how to use their arms, how to swing. I don't care the sport at the initial, but once they're playing basketball, now I have to be able to get them to accelerate knowing that probably the, maybe by the fourth step, they're gonna redirect their pathway 
So they really can't get that tall and that extended like a track effort. Right. Their feet are going to go from maybe being directly like if this is my head, this is my feet. All of a sudden, I have to change direction. So I might have to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more squatty when I move because I have to all of a sudden plant my foot to the right to push myself to the left. So, right. Yeah. So when an athlete runs in basketball, they always are projecting their body or their center mass in a new direction. So that's really important to me when I work with them on basketball specific movement. But in the initial stages, I just want them to move better as an athlete. Right. Because I, again, I've been to a lot of different uh, conferences and workshops by great speed coaches, by the way. Um, they, their philosophy might be a little bit too track and field for me. Not that that's wrong, because like as as you said, in the initial in the initial stages, there's just pretty much everything's the same. The mechanics will be the same. The knee drive is going to be the same. But when you're looking at a basketball player, very rarely is he going to be down all the way down in that position. And so that knee drive, in my opinion, might be slightly different when you're in an upright stance and how they're positioned. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to ask, because obviously um, movement is the entire asp like is the most important part of basketball. Where does strength training come into it? Then my next question would be, I feel like a lot, and I, I've been guilty of this too, uh, is strength training the icing or the cake? Or is there a gray area that we need to be talking about? Yeah, I, I, think, I think early on in an athlete's development, once they're old enough, because we talked about developing patterning, okay? But that's not necessarily true strength training as we mm -hmm. define it when we get older. Once we do that, I think in the initial stages, the strength training sets a really good foundation of applying force mm -hmm. and of absorbing force, okay? So if we can just get an athlete really good at the, the force producing phase, which we're gonna call concentric, and then if we can get them good at the isometric phase, which would be just static, and then if we can get them good at the eccentric, which would be absorbing your mass coming in, if we can get them good at that, now we can start to say, all right, this basketball player, they're not usually getting down to 90, de 90 degree knee bend before they jump for a rebound. They might get to 15 degrees. They might get to, you know, maybe 25 degrees and then they have to jump. So we might eventually at some point with them do like a step up at, you know, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. We might do a back squat or a front squat where they're only at this certain height that is going to accentuate an area that they're going to use very well. Like a volleyball player, I might do the same thing because they don't have the chance to go all the way down either. So the strength training at different stages becomes the icing, and at other stages, it becomes the cake. Right? right. If you don't have it, it becomes the cake. If you do have it and you're a really good mover, well, then it's just the icing. It's going to keep guys like you and I healthy as we age. It's going to keep our hips and our knees and our ankles and our shoulders healthy while we compete as we get older. When we're younger, we, got to, we haven't made it yet. We got to get there. So that strength becomes a really big foundation of taking that weak junior high kid, you know, seventh grader, eighth grader, who's now trying to compete with high school kids, that strength might be the reason they do or do not compete really well because they just can't hold their lines they can't defend mm -hmm. anybody because they get bumped off all the time so that's why we look at it and like you said there's gray area for some there's black for others and there's white for others so yeah right so you're thinking about it in terms of being joint specific and movements as similar as possible that you would see in basketball you 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 can and, and again it's going to be phased right right and, the closer I get to when I want them to play their best, I'll probably come, I'll become a little bit more specific with them. All right. And, and then, but in the early off season, I'm just trying to regain their normal functioning movement patterns again, but to help them when, when, uh, when I want a player to really increase their vertical at some point, I'm going to get them to that level where they're not bending all the way down and all right. the way up because that's not where they go. Right. They have to develop their elastic properties as well as their power properties, and then I can get them to jump higher and from the joint ranges they're gonna use. Right, we, we, again, we work with a lot of different athletes. I'm just thinking of one off the top of my head who's a really good fencer. He's actually number two in Hong Kong. Um, 
I was trying to explain to his parents, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, is that when they are young, basically I'm trying to set them up for success later. They're, you're not going to get a 12 year old who squats 315 or 225 or like even like you're not going to get that. But yeah. what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop those coordination and movement patterns so that when he does get into those, let's call it sensitive phases later on, he already knows how to perform those movement patterns. And now we can really try and shoot for progress when it comes to the weight room kind of stuff. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Right. And in the early stages, because you you want to you want to give them a larger toolbox. Yes. So as they get older, they can select the tool that they need for that particular competition or that particular training session or, or skill development session, whatever it is. But if they don't have the tool to pull from, now they compensate. Yeah. So give them that big, wide toolbox and, and variety and bandwidth when they're young to set them up like you said, when they're older, because they have the chance to do more. You don't give them that foundation. They don't have the chance to do more. Okay. They're going to rely just on their specific application of movement based on the sport they're doing. But if you give them more, now they can pull it from different, you know, different uh, developmental situations. Right. So Lee, you've worked with, again, a wide range of different basketball players from very young to the NBA level. Um, I think you were, were you just at the Phoenix Suns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. a while back, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah that that's awesome. So what are some of the strength or movement properties and qualities that you may see in the best athletes on the basketball court? And I'll ask you this because we were just talking about strength training. From what I've seen working with many athletes myself is that the highest jumpers, the quickest guys, the guys with the most explosive first steps may not be the ones who squat the most weight. So for you, what, what is it that they have that the other ones don't have? Yeah. So uh, this is a great question because we ha I had this conversation with another coach not too long ago. And the question was, is it more genetics mm -hmm. or is it more training or, you know, where's the sliding scale? So obviously if we get lucky and we have tremendous genetics, that's a, that's a really nice foundation to work from. So we know that. And a lot of the guys that make that elite level, genetically, they're very gifted. They're probably, most of them are average, like the average has got to be close to six, seven in the NBA overall, yeah. right? So we know they've got length, they've got size. Um, many of them have a tremendous elastic quality to them. They're just pop and they go. But mm -hmm. if you were to assess them, they're a train wreck, half of them. You know, yeah. They have no ankle range of motion. They have very little stability in their hips. <laughs> their core is a mess. Uh. But that's the, that's the benefit of having that genetic gift is that they, they can overcome that because they're so quick and so athletic. But then what happens is all the years of playing in the parks and all the years of playing travel sports and in all the seasons – now we're seeing when they hit 25 years old, which it used to be, we thought 25 was really young still in the mm. NBA. That's, that's six years into the league for some of these guys who come out really, really early. Um, what happens is that lack of dorsiflexion in the ankle, that lack of stability or internal rotation at the hip, now it starts to bite them in the butt. Now they start getting pain. So their movement qualities, like to go back to the original question, they have these abilities to overcome things that if it were you and I, normal genetics, that's what, that's what doesn't allow us to get there, right? That doesn't, because we just don't have it. But if we had those dysfunctions, that even drops us down another level. So we have to make sure we move really efficient just to compete at our level. Those guys, their deficiencies show up as missed games, you know, uh, you know, lesser, lesser uh, um, ability to stay on the court because of tendonitis or something like that, just because they don't have great movement. If you look at them in the weight room, a lot of them really struggle with the basic patterns because number one, they have tremendous long levers. I mean, they're like their femur bone is longer than me. And so when they try to squat or do something, they just don't have great levers. And if they don't have great mobility, now that makes that lever even less valuable to them because they just can't get through the joint the way they should. So yeah, it's, it, they're different, they're different athletes for sure, but they're just so gifted. That's why they're there. 
So a lot of it obviously has to do with your parents and how lucky you are with that and just oh. genetics in general. But does a lot of it have to do with upbringing? Meaning what I mean by upbringing is their childhood. What were they doing during childhood? Um, and basically, can these, again, going back to you, the question that you were discussing with another coach is, can these qualities be trained? And if so, do you need to address them early? Yeah. Yeah. So most of these guys, if you ask a lot of these guys that are at that level, they played in the parks and they played with older players. Mm -hmm. So the skill that we haven't talked about yet, which I think by far is the most important skill any athlete of any sport can learn is reading. The better I get at reading speed, tempos, angles, um, boundaries, um, speeds of a pass, speeds of a dribble, the ability to, to recognize when somebody's going to change pace or change directions on me, those are the athletes that adapt and adopt the quickest. So when I'm, when I'm in seventh grade and the men, allow, the older guys, the high school guys, or maybe the men, allow me to play on the, on the, on the main court in, in the park, in the city. If I'm allowed to play with them, I learn the game so much faster because I have to. That's why we see Brazilian soccer players mm. talented because nobody taught them when they were little. They played barefoot on the sand or in the streets, and they learned how to adapt and read. When a player at a really young age only gets skill development in a very controlled setting, they're learning how to move, they're learning, learning proper positioning, but they're not getting the reading skills unless somehow that's implementing. Reading is how Larry Bird was able to play at his level. He could read things better than anybody, and we know that that ability to recall, it's called the prediction model, that's what allows athletes to make the decision subconsciously, even before they realize they're making it. That's the premise behind reading. So a young kid who has poor genetics, relatively speaking, can still compete at a high level if, we, if they're given the opportunity to train right, give them great body movements, give them good strength, good power, good elasticity, but you put them in a situation where they learn to read the situation in front of them. That's what the best athletes do. So a lot of them, is, it's their environment. It's watching people, it's experience, it's playing with people. Yep. So what you're saying is that, I mean, this makes a lot of sense, that the environment which they are exposed to is very important. Very important. So it's, yeah. yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, I grew up playing in a lot of playgrounds where we were. And, um, and that's, that's we, we used to get, you know, invited onto the court with the older players because they yeah. ruled the courts. And when you go out there and you start to see, like the first time somebody snaps you a chest pass that's coming at you faster than you've ever had, all of a sudden that becomes normal. Yeah. Same thing with how to cut somebody off. All right. Well, it becomes, it becomes my new normal because I do it. But if I'm only in a rehearsed setting, it doesn't become what we call implicit learning. Mm -hmm. Implicit means I self-discovered how to manage that. That's what makes Allen Iverson and LeBron and, you know, Kobe. See, Kobe was an example of an athlete who had tremendous work ethic, who would break down one particular move for like an hour and a half straight. He had that component, but he also had, he'd also go to the parks and dominate and play against great players there too. So that's an example to your question. He had the genetic ability, he had the work ethic to work on the skill, but he also had the exposure to different environments that made him go to the next level. Yeah. It's one, uh, I'm just <laughs> remembering my childhood now, go, because I went over to the States when I was about six, 15 years old. Yeah. So what, the biggest thing that I remember when I first stepped in the gym to meet my teammates, um, and they were mainly from New Jersey, was the way that a lot of them jumped, like the mechanics and the strategy of which they would search for in order to get up. And being from Hong Kong, I can very confidently tell you that it was very, very different. But yeah. their way was so amazing. And I, I asked them, I was like, who taught you how to jump? And everybody said, no one. It was just, they eventually learned how to do it because of their environment and just watching people. That's right. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's what happens. You 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 learn it. I when I was younger, I'm I'm five ten, but we all during those days, I all wanted to dunk. So we all grabbed the tennis ball and tried to get. Once we got the tennis ball, you went to the volleyball, right? Yeah. Then eventually got so I could jump really well. Was never taught, but I had the ability to produce a lot of force, but really quick. And that allowed me to jump. My technique was trying to get a 5'10 body above a 10 foot rim. And I just eventually figured it out. This is how I can jump best. And that translated to me to being a really quick jump shooter, like I could pull up really quick. So those skills of being able to learn how to jump translated very well to the specific sport of basketball. Right, right. Now, let's switch gears here a little bit because we just talked about dysfunctional ankles and hips and all that kind of stuff. We're both fellows of applied functional science. We have a lot of respect for a guy named Gary Gray. Yes. Um, and if you've done any of Gary's courses, you know that the foot plays a tremendous role in everyday life, obviously, as well as especially as um, athletics. Uh, what, if any, assessments do you do to, not, I want to say isolate the foot, but primarily look at one's foot? Um, do you do barefoot training? Do, is there any time in your program where you specifically adjust the feet? Yes, right off. When I, when I initially get an athlete in, they get on my table, and I'll do the typical Thomas test and hit internal rotation. I just want to see what I'm working with. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to manipulate or adjust. I'm just trying to say what you've got, see what you've got. So I'll look at the foot and ankle. I'll look at, like we know, mid-tarsal joint. I'll look at toe dorsiflexion, especially of the first ray. Look at ankle dorsiflexion with a bent knee, a straight knee, just so I know what I'm dealing with. Because when mm. they make a quick explosive escape move, they're going to be planting that foot in aggressive dorsiflexion, typically with a bent knee that I got to make sure that they can supply the energy and they can transmit that energy really well. Then we're going to do things where they stand up and they balance on one foot. We call them balance reaches, right? So they're going to stand on their right foot. And I might say, hey, reach your foot towards 12 o'clock or your free foot towards 12 and then maybe towards three and then maybe towards, you know, seven o'clock. All I'm looking at now is, all right, when they move and they're changing their center of mass a little bit, how does that foot react to those pressures? That gives me an idea if I'm dealing with an athlete that is going to handle these forces really well. So that becomes a part of the warm up. So every day they come in, they go barefoot. We do our balance reaches, their cone reaches with upper body, with lower body. And then we start to establish a better foundation because here's the thing I believe, and this is really important right now during our current state of affairs throughout the world, is we got to be careful that we don't just keep developing great hips and hamstrings and core and let the feet fall behind. Because at the end of the day, I could have the strongest hips in the world, but if I'm going to cut or if I'm going to plant my foot to jump, if I don't have great feet, great uh, Achilles tendon, soleus, gastroc complex, I'm not going to have that elastic, that elastic ability or that stiffness to be able to support all the force coming from above. So we make sure we do what we call them bounces. You know, we just bounce like jump rope or side to side jumps or 3D jumps is another thing we'll call them. Those let me know what kind of foot am I working with? Are they mm. huge yielder or can they touch the ground like a ping pong ball and get off it really quick. So that's kind of what I look at. It's real important to me. Do you have guys that come in and they, they're just not, com I mean, not comfortable with it in a sense that it just hurts their feet to go barefoot right away? Yes, yeah, definitely not comfortable. So often what I'll do is we'll do, you know, sock foot and I have another really thin pad, but it's not so, it's not thick enough where it, it, it's like too squishy. It's just a little bit thinner. So we'll do stuff on that if it makes them feel a little bit better. But if I have had people who just have had foot stuff that they don't like going barefoot, so I don't. I don't do it. I'm, um, they have to feel comfortable. I can, if they're in a decent shoe, especially a basketball shoe that's pretty solid, you're going to get a kind of a true read of their foot versus like a shoe that has a lot of rolling and absorbing in it. It's the, it's the foam that's moved or the rubber that's moving more than the foot itself. Mm. Um, so yeah, we just make sure that they feel really comfortable. Um, the other thing that we can try to do is just maybe say, hey, give me two minutes 
today of barefoot? And then next time, can you give me five minutes you right. know, of barefoot? Or say to them, what do, you, what do you feel like you can do that doesn't hurt your foot? Or especially if they have like a fasciitis type thing going yeah. on, what can we do to help you? Right. Yeah. Let's switch gears here and talk about different phases and the off season. And I don't know what your current situation is, but all of our parks are currently closed. But yeah. say, for example, we had a lot of time on our hands and most of the people who are watching this are serious basketball players. Yeah. How would you go about periodizing or planning an off season in terms of the physical part, the technical part, and the tactical part? Because just listening to you talk, it, the tactical part, what I mean by that is a, a lot of different people playing with me at the same time, maybe a bit of five on five. And so I want to get my body exposure to that as well. How do you go about planning all that kind of stuff without overworking? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's the tough part, especially when people don't have space. Right. You know, if, if they have a garage, um, they, at least they have some space, but some people might not even have that ability if they're in an apartment and they don't have it. So the, the, the first, kind of the first thing I, I really emphasize, because we just don't know. We don't mm. know when we're going to be allowed to go back to right. or, or our old normal, our new normal is much, much different, right? So the one thing that I, I make sure every athlete does is that they maintain or they improve capacities, capacities to be able to absorb force, capacities to be able to maintain strength, you know, conditioning, have the capacity, because here's what's going to happen, Will, and you know this as well as I do, even like if we watch the NBA, they're going to go back. And all of a sudden, it's going to be near playoff time, and they're going to go 1,000 miles an hour yeah. without much of a capacity base. So I am not going to spend as much time on the explosive speed um, with long rest periods, things that I would want to see towards the middle of a season or end of a season, because if they do that, but they don't have the capacity to withstand it, they're going to get hurt. You're going to get things and Achilles and foot and ankle. So right now, one thing I try to do with my athletes is making sure that they have the capacity to withstand. They have great range of motion. They have great balance. They have uh, good movement capacity, still working on their speed and quickness, but I don't give them a lot of rest. I make sure they can do it multiple times, I may, even if they have to back off the speed a little bit. And then going to like the technical aspect of it, we will say to them, here's how I want it done. Okay, this is the technique. Your knees go here, your hips go here, your shoulders should be here on this movement. When you lose that, stop. Rest, go do another exercise, a non-competing exercise, which we could call a superset if we want, and then come back and do it again. So that's kind of how I treat them. And I'm real big on giving big rep ranges because I might say to you, I want 10 reps. 10 reps to you might be like, this is so easy. To me, it might crush me. So I give them a fatigue in a, in a technical standpoint. Once you break that, you got to stop. Now going to the tactical, the thing that we have to be able to do for the athlete now, because they don't necessarily have the ability to compete and read somebody else, is we have to be able to set up situations like, you know, maybe you'd set up a cone in the middle of your living room or outside in the sidewalk, and we go at it and we work on combinations of dribbles, mm -hmm. combinations of moves. Uh, uh, even defensively doing different things, but don't pre-program it. So for example, I might put that cone in front of me and say, okay, I'm going to go back and forth 10 times. And I can do a crossover one time. I might come in inside out. I might go between my legs, crossover. Do anything that comes to mind at that moment. That's going to build their ability to tactically be able to react in, in different situations versus only doing 10 of crossovers and then 10 of the other. Those are good to do. I'm not going to say don't do those, but if you don't mix it in, it's kind of like the tennis player who becomes the best player on hitting on a ball machine. And then they go play somebody and they can't. It's like a shooting machine for basketball. They never actually change distances and stuff. So, so that's, kind of, I know it's a broad answer, a broad question, but that's kind of what I try to do with them to make sure they're going to be healthy when they come back. Okay, same, same question, but when it comes to the in-season, I felt like, um, for me, a lot of the times, especially when I was in school, it was a time to maintain, if you understand what I'm saying. That was, that was, the, uh, that was the philosophy, at least when I played basketball, is just, just maintain whatever you have, 
And that goes in terms of strength conditioning and skill development. Yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I'm a real big fan. Let's, let's improve anytime we can. Because I don't want to be the same. First of all, I don't want to be the same team or same player when I enter the season as when I get to the end. I got to be better, right? Because a coach certainly wouldn't say, hey, once we learn the offense in the first week of the season or the second week, I just want to maintain that level by the end. Of course you don't want. You want to be better at it. You want to be smoother. Same thing with strength and movement quality. Here's the, here's the trick. Let's say in high school, I might have two to three games in a week where I might play on a Tuesday, a Friday, then I have a, sat a Saturday game or a Tuesday, Saturday or something like that. And then we're going to have some intense practices. So my window of opportunity to keep improving is going to get smaller, but that's okay because the court movement is going to make me improve. All right. I'm going to get faster just because I'm playing more. And we know that from playing in the park, right? When the snow goes away, we can get to the park. We get better as we get through the summer. So we want to make sure that we take, let's say, lateral movement and change the direction. Let's say that starts to slow down a little bit. So what we do is we take a small window, maybe two minutes, three minutes, and we just break down the ability to explode really, really well. We emphasize the technique. Maybe we clean some stuff up and we get away from it. Then we move on. Same thing with strength training. I might have done six exercises during the off season. I might do three main exercises during the season. I might take six to eight to 10 reps, bring that right down to two to four to five reps and really increase the intensity, but I might only do two sets once right. I'm warmed up. So neurologically, I can still stay really fresh. Chemically, I can stay really fresh, but coordination wise, I can still keep ramping that up. Athletes will be fine as long as you just manage how they feel. Because if they're tight and sore, well, then make any sense to go pound them. Give them a little break. That might actually help them super compensate and come up because you gave them a nice rest. So for someone like you who understands the, the technical part of it and the physical part of it, when I'm looking to say, for example, I don't get an athlete very often. If I get them two times a week. Yeah. Um, but I want to pepper in a little bit of the, that coordination and uh, increase the movement quality. If I had, say, an hour, if you can just picture this as a, as a program, where would I plug that movement quality stuff in? Right after the warm up. Yeah. So okay. Get, get them prepped up, get them going, get them moving, get them feeling good. Uh, do whatever it is that you're going to do with them. And then hit it. Now, now I, I'll, I'll say this. Let's say you want to do, you're going to have a hot, pretty high emphasis as well on like maybe some upper body power. So maybe you want to throw some medicine balls or do some band stuff. Go ahead and do that because that will kind of take the nervous system up a notch as long as it's not fatiguing stuff, then you can go ahead and start to do, maybe you're gonna do an escape move, which is so important in basketball. Yeah. Where I'm in one spot, now I have to maybe do a hip turn and explode about eight feet to be able to cut somebody off. And I'm gonna do like five reps to my right, five reps to my left, and that's it. Real technical, explosive, go really quick, so I can improve, improve the capacity to stay really quick and gain distance on that. But do it while you're fresh. They're going to get a lot of bang for the buck out of that. Same with skill work as well, right? right maybe right after I do a little bit of ball, uh, stationary ball. I, I've done my dynamic warm-up. I, maybe I went into a little stationary ball handling. I'm still fresh. I can throw it in right there. Yeah, right, right then, especially in the season. Yeah. Off-season, off you can th mix, mix it up because it's not as, it's not as um, important to the success you know, in the off season because you're not playing, right? But you can still gain the ability to do something pretty well when you're fatigued. When you're in season, you don't want to mess with patterning. And if you are really fatigued doing things, you're yeah. going to mess with patterning. So let's keep that really fresh. Right. The last part of the, the podcast that I wanted to talk about was developing relationships with your athletes, which is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing. We're talking about before off camera, we're talking about uh, buy-in. Yeah. So as much as we understand the parts about programming, which is great, it's very important, but how do you go about developing a relationship? And I'm thinking of it as Lee as the high school coach, rather than yeah. Lee as the, yeah. How do you go about developing a relationship with your team and building culture where 
everybody's on the same page. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, one thing we always did at the beginning of the season, and no matter what school I was at, and I early in my career in the in the late eighties, I was a, a boys high school coach. And then because of daughters, I ended up getting into the girls and I loved it. I loved it. And so I was a head coach at a couple of different high schools for a girls programs. The first thing I did every year when we started the season is we did these kind of like accountability type sheets where they would tell me things that they wanted to improve on. But I didn't, I didn't limit it to just basketball. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, okay, what do you want to improve in basketball? Uh, what do you want to improve as a teammate? What do you want to improve on as a, um, as a daughter? You know, what do you want to improve on as a, um, if they were spiritual or whatever, you know, anything like that, whatever made sense at that time. And then what I did is we would go through it and I'd say, so do you give me permission to hold you accountable to that? But I did the same thing. Okay. I would say, I wanted to make sure that I communicate with each one of you every day. I want to make sure that I explain things really well to you. I want to make sure my door's always open when you're struggling. I want to make sure that, and I, I would do the same thing. I'd fill it out and I'd say, you hold me accountable to this. If not, let me know. And they did too. So what that did immediately is it put us, it put us as kind of like this, um, you know, it's an overused saying sometimes, but it kind of put us as a family. Like we were kind of in it together. And so if a player wasn't, working really hard but on their accountability sheet they said i want to be one of the hardest worker every day i could pull them aside and say hey you know remember we talked about this this is one thing you wanted to do now if they said you know i just don't feel well today i said perfect go sit down go sit down you watch you help me today and so now all of a sudden they trust me uh, right. but it's because i called them on it first and then they were they felt comfortable to say coach i really don't feel well i just have a stomach ache or whatever and then we can deal with them that way so that built culture the other thing we did and my wife who you met jen was really good with this and some other parent is they they found like uh, a shelter uh for girls that were homeless and needed help and so they used to take the team i wouldn't go i would let all the girls and the, the moms take them so they they had their own time together but they developed an understanding and appreciation of what we have as right. we have new uniforms and we get basketball shoes and we get this and that these girls don't even have their own place to live they're getting help so it developed this understanding of yeah this was maybe a hard practice but it's not nearly as hard as this girl who doesn't know if she's going to eat today so yeah. those things created an environment where, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a culture of trust. It was a culture of accountability, but it was a culture of empathy as well. We kind of understood each other. Doesn't always go the way you plan it, but that can't stop you from doing the right thing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, Lee, thank you so much for your time. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I've written so many notes in my book and I hope everybody else has too. I'm really proud to call you a mentor of mine and most importantly, a friend. How can everybody learn more about you, find out more about you? Where can they go? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for asking. Again, this was just so much fun for me. This is starting my day. I know it's later for you, but this is my day. And this is a great way to start the day. But if they go to LeeTaft.com, they can pretty much find any stuff we have. If they Google me or if they look at YouTube, and go to like Lee Tab, they'll find tons and tons of free video and free tips and stuff mm -hmm. like that. In any social media, I'm pretty much at Lee Tap. They can find me on any of the major social media. So yeah, I, I look forward to uh, hopefully creating a, a following of new friends and, and be able to share some information and learn from them as well. So good. Lee, thank you so much. And we'll be in touch. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Will. I appreciate you. Stay okay, safe. You, have, you have a good one. Yeah, you too. All right, bye now. Bye.